Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at the Dana Thomas House the incredible Frank Lloyd Wright masterpiece uh, owned now by the state of Illinois, administered by the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. And we are going to show you during this 30 minutes parts of this house and the design aspects of this house that you may never have seen before or known existed and maybe never have thought about before. It's very interesting. It's part of what they have here. They're, they're re-initiating uh, their specialty tours. Right, Justin? That's correct. We offer an extended tour opportunity for people who want to find a reason to come back or maybe folks who have never been here before and want to experience it in a special way. The regular tours go on as they did before, but these specialty tours are special um, opportunities for the public to register ahead of time and come in with an expert who has really, really studied either design or some of the other aspects uh, of the house. That's correct. The site is open from Wednesday through Sunday and we give tours about every half hour beginning at 9.15 on those days, on Fridays and on Saturdays, we try to offer something special in advance. You can check out the website or you might read about these in your newspaper, but it's an opportunity for people to come in and spend time with someone who spent a lot of time at this site and generally has experience from other areas as well that they bring to bear on their tour that makes it an in-depth experience. Yeah, it might, they may really experience, somebody who's been through the house on one of the general tours may experience a deeper level of involvement and maybe be able to get some questions answered that they couldn't have gotten answered before. They sure will, and it's an opportunity to focus on a particular theme that might be appealing to them too. Well, you have made these individuals available to us to give us this special specialty tour, so thank you for that, and uh, I hope our audience enjoys what they're about to see. I'm sure they will. Well, Larry Betts, after years of giving tours at the Dana Thomas House, do you still get a thrill walking in here? I get a thrill every time I come here. I, I took seven tours of this house before I became a docent. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time I came here, I saw something new. Uh, since I've been giving tours, even today, every time I come here, I see something new that I didn't see before. And it's just a fantastic house. Does it, does it make you rush to the research books when you notice something new? Do you, do you have a source you go to to figure out what he was trying to do design-wise? I have many sources. Mm -hmm. I've got a library of about 175 books on Wright. Is that right? Uh, plus, of course, access yeah. to the internet uh, where you can just get about anything. Uh, yeah, I, I'm constantly trying to find out why did he do something? Mm -hmm. What was his motivation for that particular element of the house? Yeah. Well, and on these specialty tours, your specialty is, is the design of the house inside and out. And I assume that on these, on these tours, you get questions all the time. What was he doing here? Why, why do you do that? What was he trying to do? Sometimes you know and sometimes you don't, right? That's exactly right. Uh, most of the time, at, at this point, I kind of know, but uh, yeah. still occasionally I'll get questions that I'm not sure myself, so I try to research it and find out yeah. as soon as I can. You have gone to a number of Wright's homes. How many, how many have you visited? Uh, between his homes and buildings, probably about 30. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and you probably still have a few to, to hit, don't you? Um, <laughs> yes, in May I'm going up to Buffalo, New York. Is that uh, right? There's a number of houses up there to yeah. tour. Let's stick with this house just for okay. the next 30 minutes, okay? Sure. We're in the front hall. I, I call it the front hall. Is that is this the entry? This the is the reception hall. The reception hall, okay. Yes, if you were a guest of Susan Dana uh, and, they, and she wanted to see you, you would have been shown up into this area. Um, right. And you would have noticed that not only do you have this remarkable fireplace, but you also have this remarkable open area above you. In fact, you can see all the way to the top of the house from here. Yeah, this is uh, Wright's first experiment with a two-story space in a residence. Uh, and, and one of the significant things about this house, because money was no object to Mrs. Dana, it gave Wright the opportunity to, to kind of trial and error some things, mm -hmm. uh, experiment. And there's some things here that are first that he never did again. There's some things that are first that he continued to do in his, mm -hmm. in his Prairie architecture. Are we looking at any firsts here? Well, the two-story space is a, spa is a first here. Uh, this is the first house that he used steel structure. Uh, there's 30, 36 now. There's 36 steel beams in this house. Is that right? And that's well, a carryover from Louis Sullivan, uh, who Wright worked with for about uh -huh. six years in Chicago. 
Um, uh, Louis Sullivan pioneered the concept of steel structure in commercial buildings, and Wright, I think, uh, took that key and uh, decided he would try it in a residential. Well, let me just walk over here right behind you. This beam here is wood on top of steel. As a steel beam, right, that runs all the way down to the fireplace, a matching one, excuse me, on the other side, uh -huh. and then there's a steel beam that runs across here to connect them. And what Wright's trying to do here is create a sense of no gravity. Uh, he's trying to create a, a wow effect with a contrast. Mm -hmm. We have no gravity, and yet if you look up there, we have a tapestry hanging that creates a sense of gravity being pulling the tapestry yeah, down. Yeah, but, it, but everything he does is on purpose. Everything he does is on purpose. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no mistakes yeah. uh, here. <laughs> and, and he's got a number of contrasts going on here in this space to give a total wow effect. I mean, this is the first place you see when you walk into the house. Mm -hmm. And he's tr trying to create a number of, of those uh, contrasts to give that effect. So we've got a sense, we've got water and fire. There's a fountain over there. There's a okay. fountain over there. And the there. fire here, yeah. And to have a water feature in a house in 1900 was unheard of. So uh -huh. that, that and, and with that, he's trying to bring nature into the house. Uh, most of Wright's prairie houses are built in urban areas. They're not out on the prairie as you might expect. Yeah. Um, so what he tries to do is create as much of a sense of bringing nature into the house as possible yeah. in, a, in an urban setting. But back to the contrast, he's got the fire and the water. He's got high and low. We've mm -hmm. got a seven foot four ceiling in that part of the reception hall. And yet over here, we have a 24 foot ceiling. Mm -hmm. So great contrast. There's a very dark area over there and a very bright area here because we have this large south facing mm -hmm. window mm -hmm. to bring, especially in the winter, to bring a lot of light into yeah. the space. Yeah. You, you uh, mentioned, all of us have heard the term Inglenook. Very few of us know what it means. But that's what he was creating here. Exactly. And Ingle Nook is a small, intimate area by a fireplace in a larger room, basically. And here with the high back settles acting as walls on the sides mm -hmm. and the low ceiling area here with the art glass, he's created an Ingle Nook in a, in a larger space here. Mm -hmm. So he's got an intimate area in a very public space mm -hmm. here. And you, you also mentioned something interesting. Above this, you see this, this uh, art glass, which he created uh, in the Ingle Nook. And you can see that it's an amber color. And there was a reason for that? Too. Very definite reason. And the same thing down in the gallery. He's got amber colored glass here, so at night, when the light's on in here, uh, it gives an illusion that there's fire in the fireplace even when there's not. Mm -hmm. So you've got a nice warm glow concept. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in all of Wright's prairie houses. He has a centrally located fireplace. Uh, this is that centrally located fireplace, and uh, he saw that as being the heart of the house. Uh, this is what everything kind of mm -hmm. generated around. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's step back with me, if you would. Sure. Let, not, try not to fall off here. If we can look up, I think we can get the shot. Above, there's a the fireplace, then the balcony, and the tapestry that you mentioned. And then I notice what looks like pipe or uh, <laughs> organs from, you know, pipes from an organ up there. Uh, not so. There's, there's not an organ in the house? Uh, there is an organ of, so, of sorts. Uh, there was a, a unit that you could buy at the turn of the century, mm -hmm. a console organ. Uh, it was a player pump organ. Mm -hmm. And then there was an accessory that you could buy for it that kind of hooked into the front of it with a keyboard. The, the, the primary function of it was, was not keys at all. It was just player pump organ. You put a roll in, you pump away, oh, okay. you play organ music. Uh, and, and Wright was big into putting the newest technology type things into his architecture, and that was an example of one. Uh, Mrs. Dana never got the keyboard part of it, mm -hmm. but she did have the player pump. Mm -hmm. So she could play organ music here. When she had guests, she tried to have music of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, up here we have a musician's balcony. So uh, if it was a better class of clientele she was entertaining, mm -hmm. she would typically have a string quartet uh -huh. playing music for us here as we gathered in this space. Yeah. Well, he put those pipes up there just for show then, though, right? Oh, just totally for show. For show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's funny. I think our next stop should be yeah, the dining room. Okay. Because uh, you talk about he, what an architect does is he creates a space. And that's really the de definition of what he's trying to do in the dining room. Exactly. Can we go that way? Sure. Larry, as we enter this, this immense dining space, um, I, I love the way you described it to me earlier. You said he was trying to create, I think you said, the effect of eating outdoors under the trees. 
<laughs> right. Uh, he wrote later that he designed Mrs. Dana's dining room to give the illusion that you were outdoors under a large shade tree eating. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, so he's bringing a lot of nature into this, mm -hmm. primarily with the lighting. Uh, there's no direct lighting. As you look at the four big chandeliers in the room, you would expect them to be hanging over the dining room table. Yeah. But in fact, they're off in the corners out of the way. Uh -huh. There's indirect lighting up into the barrel vault on both sides. Uh, there's skylights on both sides and both ends of the room. There's skylights yeah. across here and a matching one at that end. You mean they're, oh yeah, they're up in here? Yeah, the huge, right here. Okay, yeah, skylights, huge skylights there. here. And on the side, you can see that there's, there's light coming down on right. the sides as well. Down both sides. So, so he surrounds it with light, but he doesn't actually put any direct light on it. No. Yeah. And he's got these little double sconces in here that he referred to as firefly lights. Uh, and those, that's above the chandelier that, that are hanging on the, uh, on the balcony up there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. There's some more at the other end of the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that's like a lightning bug coming into the room <laughs> and lighting up for you. What a hoot. So he's bringing a lot of nature in. Mm -hmm. uh, the four-wall mural in here was painted by George Niederkin, a young artist out of Milwaukee in the summer of 1904. And as you look at it, the, the three primary vegetations in it is uh, purple aster, goldenrod, and mm -hmm. sumac. Mm -hmm. And these are realistic illusions of those plants, whereas in the uh, bay window over there, we have a very geometric stylized sumac plant. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it's bringing nature into the space as much as possible so yeah. that you have that sense of eating outdoors. You, you know, he, uh, you also mentioned that he uses really three materials in here. He uses the white brick and oak and then what else? And the, plaster. And, and plaster, which, right. which, are, which are hard, cold surfaces. Yes, and, and he does a great job of warming, warming them up. Uh, his choice of brick is a very beige uh, uh, Roman brick uh, rather than a cold red brick. Uh, the oak is all stained. This is all red oak. The, the uh, woodwork in the house is all red oak mm -hmm. stained. And then the plaster is all very autumnal colors. You get mm -hmm. golds and browns and greens and so on to give a very warm effect. Yeah. And he carries that through with the barrel vaulted ceiling, which of course is kind of an orangish or a goldish color, which is what warms the place up as well. Very much. Interestingly, okay, there are two of these barrel vaulted ceilings in this house. That's correct. And he wasn't big on that design, was he? <laughs> Well, it, it, seemingly at this point he was because he put two in one house. Uh, up until this point, he'd only designed two other barrel vaults, one in his own home, uh, one in one of his bootleg homes in Oak Park. Uh -huh. And uh, after this house, there's no more barrel, barrel vaults that we've been Is able that to find. He fell out of love with them completely, huh? Well, I think more than anything else, he fell out of love with the arch. Um, he, he, the arches are big in this house yet. The main entrance has a brick arch. We saw a brick arched fireplace. Um, and that was a very Louis Sullivan thing. Uh -huh. uh, and as he's getting away from Louis Sullivan longer and longer, the arches kind of go out of his architecture. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things you notice when you come into this room is these chairs, and these are all his design. Uh, some are tall, some are short, and, they're, and they, they're, they're intervals, you know, tall, short, tall, short. What in the heck? Why, why, why would he do that, or why would she do that? Well, in Wright's residential architecture of the period, all the chairs would have been high backs. Uh, what he was trying to do is create a small intimate space within a larger space, so when the family sat down to dine, that they could be intimately involved with each it's other. It's like a wall around, like a around wall the table. around the table, exactly. Yeah. That was impractical here because there were servants going to have to serve food, and it would be virtually impossible to serve over these high back chairs. So Wright gave her an equal number of low back chairs, instructed her to alternate them <laughs> so that the servants could serve over the low back chairs easily. You didn't get to make a lot of decisions when you uh, ordered no. a Frank Lloyd Wright house, did you? No. <laughs> you know, and, and you brought this to my attention too. This is interesting. Look at if we, if we can back up just a little but the, this, all this built-in, come on over here and point this out for me if you would. All of this built-in furniture was new, wasn't it, to him? He wasn't, he wasn't designing things that way, was he? Uh, well, he, the concept that he was trying to develop here, first of all, is very much in style with his style of, of wood. Uh, uh, furniture. This is a, uh, a sideboard, but it's built in, mm -hmm. and uh, he does that for a couple of reasons. One thing, it's more efficient use of space, but secondly, you're locked into his style of furniture now. You know, unless you're going to tear this whole thing out, you have to use you his style. You don't get to choose. You huh? don't get to choose. It's, it's my way or the highway with him. Exactly. Right? That's interesting.
<laughs> well, after one of Susan's many parties, she would have said goodbye to the last guest and then come back up here to her to her bedroom. Most of her life, she was single, but right. she had a bedroom here set up for set up for two. Uh, yeah, she obviously was planning to have a man in her life when she uh, commissioned the house. Uh, it's the end of the Victorian era, so we see single beds yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it, it's not anything real modern there. Yeah. Um, but but another thing that that uh, Wright did was he when he designed her bedroom, he designed her, her a, a, a dressing table or a makeup table, one on each side, and they're almost identical, aren't they? Yeah, they're reverse images of each other. Excuse me, Mark. Yeah. Uh, you can see here that we've got a open up mirror so she could check herself out before she leaves for the day okay. uh, make sure that everything's tidy mm -hmm. there's uh, another one over on that table. side as well yeah there's one on that side yeah. correct and a dressing table and then uh, a, a open glass that she could uh, for probably for her collection of pottery uh, mrs dana had a very vast collection of pottery and oh okay so, so she would have had one wanted to have some of that here in the probably bedroom. yes okay um, and also built in around the corner were a place to hang clothes. I think you called that a chiffero, isn't that what they called well, it in those days? We called them chifferos, but here Wright builds them in. We call yeah. them closets today. Yeah, right. But the house was designed before the invention of the coat hanger. So all the closets in the house have hooks and shelves. There's mm -hmm. no rods for, for mm -hmm. coat hangers. Mm -hmm. if, if we look at, on a typical morning to the east, the sun would have risen and, and, and brightened up this part of the house very early. And maybe that's why he chose this east window in the master bedroom to put his, his uh, uh, what are the critters he's got in this window here? Large dragonflies. Dragonflies, that's right. You gotta yeah. use your imagination to yeah. see the dragonflies. It's geometric, it's uh -huh. stylized, but uh, he wrote later that he designed dragonflies in Mrs. Dana's uh, bedroom window. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll we'll take yeah, it, take him for his word. I kind of see it, and then above above our heads, this is a. I don't think we've seen a cathedral ceiling yet in this yeah. house, but this is a di whole different style, isn't it? Than we've different seen. style of ceiling. Uh, this would be called this, uh, like you say, cathedral ceiling. Uh, just about every imaginable style of, of ceiling that you can put in a house except a dome is here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the barrel vault already mm -hmm. and now we've got a cathedral ceiling And here. why do you suppose that was? Uh, he's just opening up this space and he's probably showing off a little bit that I can <laughs> I can put them all together in one I'm house. not a one-trick pony. I can no. do it all, right? Exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, this much of this house is called the sumac, sumac. And again, we see the same sumac design on the, on the bedpost. So, it's all throughout the windows and everywhere in a sense. Yeah, that's the that's one of the most common themes throughout the house is a sumac, and of course the sumac plant was indigenous to the prairies of Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, part of his prairie concept. But these are uh, in in white oak. This is all quarters. All the furniture in the house, by the way, is all quarter sawn white oak. Uh, all of the furniture, the freestanding furniture, was designed by Wright for this house. Most of it designed for a specific spot in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where this goes, this is where this goes, and Wright is a very controlling architect. He wants to have total control over the whole picture of, of what's going to happen mm -hmm. here. Um, and he's making this presentation very much like a work of art. Mm -hmm. And before we leave this room, if you would Larry, reach up behind you there and show us the evidence that uh, that he had ideas for how they could light this house as well. Cause this was, did you say it's the first house in Springfield that was electrically built for electricity? Right, it's the first house built in Springfield that had electricity as part of its original construction. And, uh, and electricity initially was just for lighting, and you see all kinds of lighting throughout the house. But here we have a receptacle and a plug-in for mm -hmm. light that hung over the dressing table here. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's, this is new technology, believe it or not. I mean, we take receptacles in a house totally for granted today. Yeah. But, uh, this is very new technology. Even the receptacle's beautiful. Brass, yeah. solid brass. Larry, by today's standards, this is not a big bathroom, but back in 1902, this was something else, wasn't it? Oh, very much. Uh, at a time in, in Springfield's history where there were very few homes that had running water, Mrs. Dana had not only a nice vanity, she's got a toilet, she's got a bidet, she's got a tub. She has what we believe is the first walk-in shower in residence in the United States. Um, right. Wright worked under the concept that a house was not completely designed until it was completely built. Uh -huh. And he was not adverse to 
uh, as the house was being built, seeing that, oh, here's a way to improve it, uh, he would do that. And that's one of the things that he did here. Originally, that shower was a closet for the room next door, and, uh -huh. and uh, he converted it into a walk-in shower. Okay, so that would have been accessible from the room next door. It would have been a closet, but voila, now you got a walk-in shower. That probably right. wowed her, too, I'll bet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she liked the latest things. Yeah, yeah. And of course, my goodness, well, like you said, very few people had running water. She had lots of running water and lots of ways to get to it, didn't she? Well, and, and there's three bedroom suites, each of them with their own bathroom in this house. Uh -huh. Plus there's a bathroom between the two maids' rooms uh, above the kitchen. Uh, there's a half bath down in the, yeah. uh, down by the bowling alley for the gentlemen to use. So there's yeah. bathrooms all over the Just house. Just a little earlier, we were talking about electricity and how it was new in Springfield at the time. And this is really goes, points that out because she had these, these uh, beauty, uh, uh, appliances here. What is this one on the right? This is a gas-fired hair blower, hair dryer. Mm -hmm. This is a gas-fired hair curler wow. that uh, she actually used. Yeah, yeah that's kind of scary to me. <laughs> one of our guests said they look like weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're sitting on, again, a, a, a built-in right design vanity, I guess you'd call it, exactly. with, with a right chair uh, for, for her to, to dress and Get and pretty and, with. And all the closets in here again, there's no rods. There's those just hooks and shelves um, mm -hmm. to hang things. After her parties, Larry, uh, I, I guess Susan wanted uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to make sure that the men had something to do to entertain themselves. Yes. And, and uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good option, isn't it? And she had request, requested formally of right that I want a place in my house for the gentleman guests to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And this is what he gave her, uh, probably the first man cave. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. And there wasn't another private bowling alley no. in Springfield, I would say. No, this is actually a duck pin alley. It was a very new game at the turn yeah. of the century. Again, Wright was big into doing yeah. that. Yeah. Or they could have wanted to play some billiards. Play billiards. Uh, there would have been spittoons and ashtrays and places for cigars to be put out and everything down here, wouldn't there? Yeah, exactly. There were spittoons in all four corners here in, mm -hmm. in this space. And uh, so the men could come down here and smoke and chew and tell stories. Mm -hmm. and, just hang out. Yeah, and he also, you know, you say that he's, he's constantly thinking about building for the customer and what their needs might be. And of course, she was a very wealthy woman, had a lot of jewelry and personal effects that were worth a lot of money, so he put her in a safe, didn't he? Right, he gave her this walk-in safe. You can see the names are on here. Um, and I'll open this up for you. You can see you can walk in. Mm -hmm. uh, she would have kept some cash here, of course, but mainly this is for jewelry and, mm -hmm. and documents uh, that she, she would have had yeah. of all of her properties that she owned, etc. Interesting how he, he made this look like it was a, just an inconspicuous door. It was not, there's nothing to see here. You know, so he right. put the top of the safe, he puts a... So, yeah, he did this so there wasn't yeah. obviously a, yeah. a safe behind it. Mm -hmm because public would be down here and sure. didn't want to tempt sure. anyone. And interestingly too, he had, a, he had a way for her to know when it was time to go to the safe, didn't he? Yeah, the, <laughs> the safe was on a timer. You could only access it between 9 and 9.30 every day mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and between 4.30 and 5. So he put a bell up in her bedroom that went off at 9 o'clock and 4.30 every day to remind her, you got 30 minutes to get into your safe. Isn't that fascinating? Well, Larry, I want to thank you so much for making the trip from home. You had a, a kind of risky uh, weather situation right. today, but you came in for us, and we certainly appreciate it. And good luck on your tours. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate it. Larry Betts is one of the two giving the specialty tours that will run throughout the summer here at the Dana Thomas House. You do have to call ahead and make reservations. Not, don't just show up. And there is a suggested donation. With another Illinois story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. 
Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.